Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Evaluate webinar on the annual ATE survey. In the next 90 minutes, we're going to showcase the changes to the survey this year, clarify some of the vocabulary we use, and talk in detail about how to use the survey information for your own project purposes. Here are the cast of characters. I'm Stephanie Evergreen from Evaluate. Our main presenters in this webinar will be Lori Wingate, Evaluate's PI, and Jason Burkhardt, our project manager. David Campbell is with us. He's our program officer at NSF. Also here is Dan Hull, the PI at Optech, another AT center in Waco, Texas. David and Dan will be discussants during the webinar, talking about ways they've used the survey results and managed the survey process. To help you keep track of who is saying what, we've put the presenter's picture and name in the upper right-hand corner of each slide. And this is the time I have to point out to you that the views expressed by our presenters today are theirs and theirs alone and don't necessarily reflect those of NSF. As always, behind the scenes we have Lara Smith making sure this webinar runs smoothly. Lara works with Maytech, an ATE center at Maricopa Community Colleges, who graciously hosts all of our webinars here at Evaluate. Before we dig in, I'm going to take just a moment to orient you to some of the things that you need to know to make the most out of your time with us today. So let's review this webinar platform. The chat box is where you should type in your questions and comments. And you can type those in at any time. Just be sure that you send them to this room so that everyone can follow the conversation. We'll take a couple of Q&A breaks throughout the webinar. And I'll be keeping track of the questions so that we can address them during those breaks. If you happen to have a technical issue, you can send it just to the moderators, and you'll pick that from this drop-down menu here. So let's practice using the chat box right now. We want to know a little bit more about you. So in the chat box, would you type in the position um, you hold at your organization and how many people are in the room with you viewing this webinar right now? So go ahead and type that into the chat box, the position you hold at your organization and how many people are with you watching this webinar. Oh, good. Great, great. Good to see all of you knowing how to use the chat box, and good to see so many of you here. And while you're typing those, I'm going to point out one more thing about this webinar platform, which you may have already noticed, and that's the participants box. Up there, you're going to find a list of everyone who is attending the webinar. And you might see people that you know. And it is totally cool to send them notes, as some of you already have. But you should know that the moderators do see anything that every, anyone types into the chat box there. OK, well, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about you. It looks like we have a great group together today. One new thing we haven't done before in this webinar, we're going to ask you to use your highlighter. This participation requires two steps. When we ask you to use the highlighter, you'll see two columns of tools show up just to the left of the whiteboard. The second one down in the second column is the highlighter. Once you click on the highlighter, then you can select the color you'd like to use from the two rows that are going to be at the bottom of your screen. So let's test that one out, shall we? Let's learn a little bit more about each other in the process, too. So on this map, we'd like you to mark your location. So use that highlighter tool, and then pick a color, and then make a mark on the map to show us where you're located right now. And if you are joining us from outside the United States, just make your mark off the coast somewhere. Several of us are here in Michigan, so I know we're going to get some overlap there. Look at that dispersion. This is fantastic. And the people who are in Hawaii are not allowed to make any comments to us Michiganders about what the weather is like right now. All right. Well, welcome to all of you. We're just about to start, but let me address a few things, a few good things that always come up. Right after this webinar, I'm going to email you a handout that includes links and key points that are brought up today. It's also available along with our slides in our digital resource library, and the URL is there on the screen. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available next week. And I will email you the link when it's ready for viewing. The last thing I need to tell you is that we hope you will get out of your time with us today. The intention is that by the end of the webinar, you'll be able to understand how and why the ATE annual survey is conducted. You'll have a clear understanding of the survey questions and how to answer them. And you'll know how the data you provide for the survey can be used for other purposes. So let's get right on that with Lori Wingate. Thank you, Stephanie. So in this first part of the webinar, I'm going to give you the what, when, who, how, and why, or try to anyway, of the ATE annual survey. So the ATE annual survey is a web-based survey of ATE PIs. Um, and I'll get into the particulars who actually who completes the survey in a moment. It's been conducted annually since 
um, 2000. It's probably the longest running survey of grantees of any NSF program, certainly in the education directorate. I've been involved in running the survey since about 2008. Um, our co-PI, Arlen Gullickson, is uh, on as a participant in the webinar, so he's in the chat. If you have really hard questions or anything that happened, questions about things that happened before 2008, I encourage you to direct those questions to him. The survey was originally part of an evaluation of the ATE program that was conducted by the Evaluation Center here at WMU with Arlen as the PI for that effort. There was a lot more to the evaluation than just the survey. It included things like case studies, site visits, um, special focus studies on, on various topics. The evaluation en ended in, um, I think it was about 2006, and since then the survey has served more of a monitoring function. And what I mean by that is that we don't use the results to make judgments about the quality or effectiveness of the program, but to provide um, annual updates regarding the status of the program, mainly its reach and its main outputs. We also um, facilitate the use of the survey da data for research purposes by other people. Um, because WMU and the survey were associated for so many years with the ATE program evaluation, there is a lingering perception um, that the survey is still intended to be an evaluation of the program, as, as people often refer to the survey as the evaluation. But I want to emphasize here that the survey is not an evaluation of the program. And I'm hoping that will become more and more clear as we go through um, the content today. And more importantly, the information that grantees provide for the survey is not used in any way to evaluate individual project and center performance. Nor will your survey responses ever be subjected to some kind of audit. Once in a while, we'll see a response that seems way out of range with other responses. So we may call somebody up and say, hey, we just want to make sure this is accurate or, you know, just as a, as a double check. But, you know, no one's going to, you know, come in and check your records and, and check the veracity of your, of your um, results. So we're hoping that puts everybody at ease a little bit. Before we move on, I'm curious about how many of you um, have participated in the survey before. And I know some of you are evaluators and may have helped supply information to, uh, to the survey. So if you've been involved in um, completing the survey in any way, if you could just raise your hand. And your hand is at the lower, your webinar hand is at the lower left of the participant box. So you can just click that, and um, that will raise your hand. So. So nearly half of everybody has raised their hand. That's great. So we have a lot of experience in the room. Well, for those of you um, who have participated in the survey before, I have great news for you. The 2012 version of the survey is about a third shorter than last year's version. The 2011 um, survey had seven sections. The print version was about 27 pages long, and it had 5,600 words. Now, the 2012 version has been reduced to five sections. It's 11 pages shorter than the prior version. And it's not just because we've done something like reduce the font or the margins or try to be sneaky like that. It has actually almost 2,000 fewer words than the prior, prior version. So we're talking about a serious reduction in length. And I'll talk about those changes in a moment. Oh, I'm talking about those changes right now. The questions we've removed. Um, are things that we, we've determined we don't need to ask every single year. We can reintroduce them in a year or you know, every two years, every three years, and so forth, and still get a sense of where the program is. For example, we took questions out about um, what kind of workforce needs assessments the grantees are conducting, their use of various kinds of advisory committees, um, detailed questions about evaluation practices. Um, and we've also eliminated the more fine-grained questions about student outcomes. Um, that said, we have preserved most of the questions that ask for numbers. Um, numbers of people receiving professional development, for example. Numbers of curriculum materials that are to be, being developed. Numbers of students served, and so on. One of the purposes of the survey is to get a handle on the main outputs of the ATE program. So the tangible results, um, those numbers, those are the things we need to keep track of from year to year, those core questions. So those are still in the survey. Um, so what is in the survey now? As I mentioned, there's five sections. The first section gathers information um, from the grants about how they operate. This section um, includes questions that used to be in three separate sections of the survey. 
on grantee characteristics, organizational practices, and collaboration. Those used to be three separate sections. Now, for lack of a better label, for the time being, we're calling this section Grant Characteristics and Practices. So the second section um, is for grantees who are primarily engaged in material development. Section three is for those whose work focuses on professional development. Section four is for grants involved in program improvement and development. And the final section is reserved for topics of special interest. These are questions that are being asked for specific research purposes. For example, they include topics that NSF program officers want to know about. And I'm going to get into the particulars of uh, sections one through four um, after we have a question break. But now I want to give you um, a sense of what's in this special topic section, because that's new for everybody. We started this section last year as a way to ask questions on a one-time basis or an occasional basis. And this year, we're asking about PI's interests in resources for entrepreneurial education, their opinions about the state of college advising, what tools or strategies, if any, they're using to track graduates, and what special efforts they may be making to recruit or retain students from various underrepresented groups. And these questions came um, from various various sources. So when does the survey happen? The survey will launch on February 15th this year. Pretty much happens the same time every year. We realize that the survey timing does not fit everyone's schedules perfectly. But if you've ever tried to schedule something that involves lots of people, you know that as soon as you schedule it to fit one person's schedule, it's not going to work for somebody else. So after trying lots of different things over the years, we've settled on asking the questions from a calendar year frame of reference. So we run the survey from mid-February to mid-March, and the questions are about the prior calendar year. So this year, that means we're asking about what happened in 2011. So after the survey launches on February 15th, we'll send weekly reminders to those who haven't completed the survey, as well as those who, who may have started it but haven't completed it. And that's just to make sure it doesn't fall off the radar. Um, if you haven't responded by the third week, um, NSF will send a reminder out. And that is usually pretty effective in prompting responses. I want to point out here, we do not provide NSF program officers with anybody's individual responses. We will, however, let program officers know who does, does and doesn't respond to the survey if they ask for that information. So the survey will close on March 14th. And after that point, it is no longer possible to complete the survey online. It is possible to get a hard copy and complete it that way, but that really isn't um, advisable. It's more cumbersome for you as well as us. Um, so for those of you who've been around for a while, <clears throat> I know I'm going to get this question. So um, we have been known to extend the deadline beyond that four-week period. Um, but that decision is made um, as needed. It won't be made until we get closer to the deadline and see how things are going. And there isn't a guarantee of an extension. So Please don't count on extensions. Really keep that March 14th deadline as uh, a pretty firm in your mind. So that brings us to the question of who completes the survey. This is a photo of the Getting Started workshop at the ATEPI conference last October. And this is uh, Dave Campbell here. See if I can do this circle over there at the podium uh, addressing the, the new grantees of the ATE program. And much like attendance at the PI conference, the hope and the expectation is that all ATE PIs will complete the survey. The exception is for PIs for planning grants. Um, last year, the survey went out to about 250 PIs, and more than 90% of them completed at least part of it, which is really a wonderful response. Um, and it's so important that we get a, a good, uh, good response rate so we get a good handle on what's going on with the ATE program. Now we know that ATEPIs aren't always the people who have the best handle on what's happening in a, in a given project. And we know it's not unusual for someone in a project, um, like a project manager or an internal evaluator, someone like that, to take responsibility for survey completion. So we've set it up to make it easy for PIs to assign the survey, the whole survey or a section of it, um, to somebody else to complete. And I'm going to show you how that works in a little bit. So as I mentioned before, the survey has five sections this year. And most of the questions in the first section are going to apply to all grantees. So we ask that everyone to complete this section, along with the special topic section. If a question, if a question doesn't apply to you, it is perfectly OK to leave it blank. 
So sections two through four are a little different, and whether you answer them depends on the focus of your grant. For example, let's look at materials development. If your project spent at least 30% of its budget, or at least $100,000, on developing curriculum materials for national dissemination, we would like you to complete this section. If you don't meet that threshold, but you want to report on the work anyway, um, you may do so. Now, this is just a, a guideline to so that people, this is sort of proxies, guidelines to help someone figure out if this is a significant place where they're investing their grant um, effort. So if you consider this a major focus of your work, um, you can complete, we want you to complete that section. And the 30% versus 100,000 and 100,000 is our guidelines for helping people determine whether they should um, complete that section. And we have a question at the beginning of uh, the materials development section, the professional development and program improvement, um, that basically ask about whether you meet those thresholds or if you want to complete the section, even if you don't. Um, so you can at least go into each section and answer that first question, even if the whole section doesn't apply to you. Um, we realize that people who got their grants in 2011 um, haven't had a whole lot of time to do much. So we don't expect new grantees to complete these um, middle sections, which are really about the outputs. You may not have any outputs yet. Um, so it's OK to skip those sections if you're a new grantee. So we are currently in the midst of contacting PIs to confirm their grant information and email addresses. We want to make sure we have correct information for, every, for everyone before the survey starts. So we're, we'll send the login information to all PIs when the survey launches in February. That login information includes the grant number, um, the PI's email address, and a unique password. And along with that information, we'll, we'll send the URL for the survey. It's critical that this information, that login information, be entered precisely at the login screen for the survey. It's best, best to actually copy and paste the information. I, I really can't tell you how many times I've had PIs call me up and say, the login information you, you sent me, it's not working, it's not working. It's, 100% of the time, it's always a keying error. I do it myself when I have to log in. You have to be very, very careful. Even when you cut and paste, you might grab an extra space, and then it won't allow you to log in. So we do test all the lo well, not all the logins, but a good number of the logins before we send it out. So um, we're pretty confident that it's all functional. So uh, just uh, try to be very, very careful as you enter that login information when you get it. It's also a good idea um, to start early. Uh, just to make sure there aren't any technical issues that could prevent you from completing the survey on a timely way. In rare cases, there are firewall issues that cause problems on the user end. I really, I, I can't really speak to what or why that happens. Um, but the best thing to do is as soon as you get the login information to go go and log in just to see if you can get in. Um, it's, it's rare that there are problems, but they have happened in the past. And if that does happen, I would work with uh, you as well as our um, programmer to resolve the issue. It has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, um, please note the survey does not automatically save your responses. If you close the survey window before hitting the Save button, you'll lose data. And that's incredibly unfortunate. We don't want that to happen. We have Save buttons at the top and bottom of each survey page to help remind people that they need to be saving. Um, I recommend hitting Save after you input any answer that re might require some effort to redo. That way, if your browser crashes or you lose internet connection or whatever, you're not going to lose much of the data you've inputted, if any at all. So as I mentioned before, it's possible for PIs to delegate all or part of a survey to someone else to complete. And I'm going to show you how that works now. After you log in, you'll get a welcome screen that looks like this. This is actually a screenshot um, from last year's survey. If you want to assign someone else to complete the survey, the entire survey, you click the delegation button here. You'll be prompted for the person's name and their contact information. Then that person will automatically be notified and sent their own login information. Selecting this option, go to survey questions, will allow you to view the questions, start answering the questions, or delegate just certain sections of the survey to someone else to complete. When you first um, get into the survey system, after you get past that first screen, there's what we call a survey management page that looks, um, kinda, at least part of it looks kind of like this. And your options are to view, start, or delegate. 
And you want to note the difference here between view and start. View means just that you can only view the questions. If you enter any responses, they won't be saved. And this is an option so that PIs who do delegate their survey to someone else are still able to access the survey and see the responses that have been provided and the progress being made on the survey. To answer the questions, you have to select Start. And once a section has been started, rather than Start, you'll see Resume here. This will change to Resume. So if you've already started a section, that will be your option there to go in and answer questions. OK, I've gone through the what, the when, how, who, but you probably still want to know why you're being asked to do this. The ATE program was established um, by Congress in 1992, and its budget has to be approved every year by Congress. So it's important to be able to give Congress some information about what's being done with all that money. It's currently about $60 million per year. So the survey is intended to provide a high-level view of the program who and how many people it's serving and what its outputs are. In that regard, it's kind of like an aerial view of a neighborhood. From this perspective, we can determine how many houses there are, how big their yards are, how many have one or two garages, what types of trees are growing, and so on. From this view, this high-level view, we can't really determine what color you painted your living room or the type of art you have on the walls, the quality of lighting, and so forth. So the survey provides a high-level view of the ATE program. But if you want to highlight what's unique and especially I just got an error message. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, I got a really weird error message. I'll just keep going. Um, OK, so the, high, the ATE pro survey is providing that high-level view. But if you want to showcase what's really special, unique, outstanding about your particular grant, the place for that would be your annual report to NSF or your project level evaluation report. That analogy works for me. I hope it makes sense to you. And that brings us to one of the questions we get about the survey a lot. Can you just use the information we provide in our annual fast lane report? Well, the thing about fast lane reporting um, is that it's for all NSF grantees. Whether you're doing experiments on slime mold, and that was featured on the NSF homepage recently, or developing a wind energy technician program at a community college, it's, it's got to work for a huge array of, of types of projects. Also, the fast lane system generates PDF reports. And there's no easy way to aggregate data from 250 or so different PDF reports. Now, the annual survey of ATE grantees, on the other hand, is obviously ATE specific. And the data go into a database, which we then use to pull together the results from all the responding PIs. OK, so I think that I'm at the end of my first section. I'm happy to take, um, oh, I just want to say one more thing. In terms of the annual survey and the annual reporting, of course, there's overlap in the information you need for those two um, types of reporting. And Jason's going to speak to uh, that a little bit later in the webinar. So I'm happy to take any of your questions on all of this in a moment. But right now, I'm going to turn things over to um, evaluate NSF program officer David Campbell so he can share his perspective on the survey and its purposes. Go ahead, Dave. OK, can you hear me? I got my mute off right now. Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hey, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so thanks very much, um, and welcome. And uh, thank you guys all for participating in here. Um, I wanted to reiterate what uh, Lori said a minute ago about uh, the importance of a survey, especially at that 1,000-foot uh, level, about how we can integrate all the data together. Um, there's a lot of people that are going to benefit from the survey. Of course, Western Michigan benefits because we gave them money to do it, so they're doing a good job with that. Um, there's going to be benefits to you folks as the principal investigators as well. Um, in a minute, Jason's going to go through um, his presentation and show you how it will benefit you um, by participating in the survey. It will help you get your evaluation uh, pretty much in order so that when you do your annual reports, it will make your life much simpler. Okay. And uh, Dan Hall will also talk in a little bit about uh, how the uh, survey has helped him with his uh, project in the past as well. But it also helps us at NSF as well. 
Um, every now and then we'll get a sudden call from Congress and say, um, okay, why are we funding this program? Uh, who does it impact? How many jobs have been created? How many students have graduated, et cetera? And I have no way of collecting that data quickly. I mean, I would run through the annual reports and one by one, you know, count the number of students that have graduated because we don't have this large survey that accumulates all the data and synthesizes it together. So it's extremely important uh, for us and very helpful that we can get this information quickly. Uh, some of you might have known a couple years ago the entire ATE program almost disappeared because the congressional staffer said, well, this is something the Department of Education should do. Um, the 64 people online here, you know, you all know how important the ATE program is and you appreciate its value. And, and so I am preaching to the choir, but I need to remind you that we're still a small parish, more or less. Uh, even though we've been around for 20 years, it, the ATE program is not all that well known as we might expect. Um, just yesterday, uh, I was at a meeting with um, a lot of folks from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and there are representatives there from the Department of Labor, um, Department of Energy, and some other federal agencies. We were talking about the, um, the new round of the TACT program, that T-A-A-C-C-C-T program that the Department of Labor is putting out. And uh, they've come to the realization of the Department of Labor, okay, we put this money out, and like, they suddenly realize that they're going to have to find a way to measure the impact. And um, fortunately, I, when I was there, I was able to point to Evaluate and uh, some of the other programs that we've done at NSF as a mechanism by which, um, not really a mechanism, but a model that maybe the Department of Labor could um, mimic or adapt somehow so that it could get their uh, measurement of impact out. They're also concerned about developing a community, and I think Evaluate, um, by participating in the survey, you also develop a community uh, by doing this as well. Uh, you all go through the same little hassles when you come to the PI meeting. You can all get together and um, talk about how much fun it was to participate in the survey. So it does have a, a small role in developing the community as well. Um, I've heard from other people investigators after they've participated in the survey and said that uh, it really wasn't that bad and it really did help them prepare for their annual reports as they um, moved on into the future. Um, so basically, you know, um, it is an evaluation, it is a survey, um, it helps you with your evaluation. Um, I can't go to Lori and say, what did such and such say about their individual project? Um, so there's, you know, no way that this is going to work against you. Um, also, you got to keep in mind that NSF's role, now that you've got awards, we want nothing better than for your project to succeed. So um, if anything seems to be out of line, you know, they can, um, point you in our direction that uh, we can help you. Um, basically, it comes down to you know the big shift in um, DC is the fact that since you're all being funded with taxpayer money, uh, you've got an obligation to report uh, accurate information and uh, to be able to quickly um, provide information about the impact of your project to date. So it is an obligation, but it also is a great benefit both to you and uh, for the ATE community as well. So I want to thank you for uh, your future participation in this program. And uh, I'll be sticking around later on if you have questions coming along. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, David. And let's do move into questions now. We already have some rolling in, but um, go ahead and if you have some uh, for Lori or for David, go ahead and type them in now. Um, OK, I, I did see one. I'll just point out. I did see one that was about whether the survey can be a useful benchmark. And we are going to address that in a later part of this webinar. So I'm going to pause on that one until then. A question from Jane, though, that I'll pitch to Lori. How will we go about getting a question in that special topic section? Oh, that's a good question. You know, it's, it hasn't been very systematic to date. Uh, we've put out you know, messages to PIs or researchers. If, if you're interested in putting a question on, let us know. Um, my experience this year tells me this is it's a much more involved process and takes a lot more time um, to get somebody's questions into shape for the survey um, than we have, have allowed ourselves time for. So I actually added a little note on this year's survey that says anyone interested in submitting a question um, should let us know by, I can't remember the date, I think I may have said June 1st. We really need to know early so we can start working with you. The questions do have to have um, some relevance 
beyond your, you know, your immediate grant. They can serve research purposes. It can be sort of a needs assessment um, if you're thinking about pursuing a, a different area of ATE. If you want to know what the what the state of things are, so that's um, we're going to ask people to send those requests to me by June first, and then we will just work with you um, to make sure the questions are appropriate. Um, we can't put a whole lot of questions in. We don't want to add. We're trying to shorten the survey. We don't want to add a lot of uh, links to it. Um, and then to get them into shape, because uh, survey crafting survey questions is often not as straightforward as you would think. And uh, you, need, you need to do a lot of a lot of careful um, crafting to make sure they're going to be answerable and, and make sense to the to the population. Sure. Good. OK. And then um, Claudia has a question about whether more than one person can work in the same section of the survey. Another good question. Um, it's a yes and a no. Technically, uh, I mean, no. One person can access that survey section at a time. So the PI will, uh, has access to the entire survey. Um, if they want to delegate, and they delegate a certain section to somebody else, they can then go in with their own login information and get to that section. Now, a workaround for that is to share your login information. So, if I'm a, you know, if I, as PI of our project, I want Jason to, to to answer just one or two questions, but I still want to be able to get into it with my own in login information, I would probably just share my login information with him. So we would just use the same, but we wouldn't want to be doing it at the same time. So you. Um, careful with that. Another option is we have a print version of the survey. And I saw somebody else's question about they were working on the October 2011 version. Um, the final version is up now. That special section topic has been finalized. So I would uh, encourage you to look at that. It's not a lot different than what we had up earlier. But um, an option there would be to have give the person a, a print copy and put their answers on that if you, if you want to have them be responsible for um, Answering certain questions, and then and then the PI or whoever has responsibility for that section could actually input it into the online system. Okay, good. And and Dan's question about the October two thousand and eleven draft been released. Is are there a lot of significant changes since the October draft, or are they good to go? Um, the the significant difference is that the final special topic section, the questions are all there now. They weren't back in October. We were still working on them. Anything else is going to be fairly minor. Um, I think maybe the, the another big difference, I'm trying to remember the, the, the timeline of these activities. I think the, the October 11 version may have still included those fine grade student outcomes. We used to have four subcategories excuse me, subcategories under how many students have completed. Then we had all these, these different um, categories of ty different types of outcomes for completers and non-completers. And we've eliminated those uh, four subcategories. And now we just ask for numbers of um, completers and non-completers, so the, the higher level. So that might not have been in the, uh, or that those fine green questions may have still been in the October version. OK. I see a question from Phil Davis about does Congress ever have awardees testify? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is yes, um, they have on occasion. Um, typically, when they ask uh, someone to testify, they'll have uh, someone from NSF, like the assistant director or the director, come and testify. But there have been numerous occasions where NSF awardees have come in and testified. Usually, it was um, more of an adversarial kind of thing that was to uh, justify uh, an expense that had a, like a, an odd title or something, like why did we fund uh, a program to develop a treadmill to see how well shrimp run on it or something like that. Um, so we don't often get uh, requests for what is to testify when things are going really well. But it has happened in the past. OK, good. I'm glad you saw that question in time. And Beverly has a question here about where to get a copy of the current survey, Lori. Yeah, I saw that. I was just going to try to paste the URL in. If you go to, uh, I'm going to find it right now. It's if you go to evaluate.org and I'm going to paste it for you right now. Um, go to the annual survey section of our site. There should be. There is. I'm looking at it now. Um, uh, it's the first link on that page. It's a PDF version. It's also in the handout that we'll distribute afterwards. So. Um, You'll get the exact yeah. URL there, too. Good point. Oh, good. OK. Thank you. And then we had a question, Lori, that I'm going to send to you about what survey software are we using? 
Um, another good, interesting question. This was back when the survey started in 2000, and Arlen can chime in on the text in the chat box if he wants to. Um, online surveys was is, was fairly new thing. There was I don't think there was Survey Monkey, or if it was, it wasn't very sophisticated. There's lots of online survey systems now, tons of them. Um, we dabbled with that a few years ago. We thought, oh, we should just well, I should preface that by saying we our system is custom. It's customized. We work work with a consultant who designs the system from the ground up for us. We dabbled in trying to use a program uh, called Hosted Survey a few years ago, thinking if we took control of this, it's easier for us to make you know make edits and, and get to the data when we need it and so forth. And it turned out to be an incredibly daunting task. There's limit our, our survey, you know, there's some complex questions in terms of like questions set up in, in matrices, which often isn't an option in the in the more broadly available programs. Um, so the short answer is uh, we use a, an expert um, in this area who custom designs a system for us. But I would invite others to put in the chat box the programs they use, because there are lots of good ones out there. Um, SurveyMonkey, Hosted Survey. Our university now has its own uh, bought a, some kind of um, license or, uh, for a, another system that uh, we have free access to now. So. I would ask people to uh, give advice about what survey systems they use. Great. And then when people, while people are typing that in, why don't we just go ahead and turn things back to you now, Laurie, to talk about definitions. OK. Oops. Um, so in any kind of survey, you, you have to operationalize what you mean by certain terms. So respondents are going to answer from a common frame of reference. For example, you might ask, do you exercise regularly? But people are going to have very different ideas about what constitutes exercise and what we mean by regularly. So we include definitions on the ATE survey form to add clarity to the terms we're using. But even so, we know questions do arise. So we're going to use this part of the webinar to give a little more guidance um, on what some of the questions on the survey are really asking about. The survey terminology and the definitions on, on the survey are very closely aligned with what is in the ATE program solicitation and the fast lane recording system. So I want to take a, a look first at questions about collaboration. And that those appear in the first section of the survey, which everybody is expected to complete. On the survey, we define collaboration as, quote, a relationship with another institution, business, or group that provides money or other support to your project or center. Collaborators are not funded by the grant. And the key, um, the key piece here is that they are not funded by the grant. Let's see if I can find the marker there. Not funded by the grant. That's really the defining feature there. Um, this is pretty much how partners are defined in um, when you do your fast lane report. So this is a question that appears on the survey with regard to collaboration. It's asking for the number of collaborators um, from various sectors. So business and industry within a host institution, other educational institutions, and public or governmental agencies, and other ATE grantees. Now, in the fast lane system, PIs are asked to identify partner organizations that may have provided, I'm quoting here, financial or in-kind support, supply facilities or equipment, collaborate in the research, exchange personnel, or otherwise contribute. So here's some examples of what would be counted as collaboration for the surveys. Purposes. Um, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just examples. Um, someone serving on an advisory board um, whose time is is compensated by his or her employer and not by the grant. Donation of time to present um, in a workshop or something like that. Uh, a donation of space or materials. Things that you would not count as collaboration would be, for example, if you had a one-time uh, brief phone conversation with somebody to get their advice on some aspect of your project. Nor would you count anyone you're paying out of your grant, or the use of space that you would be using even if you didn't have the grant. Now, another set of questions asks PIs to report the monetary value of the collaborator's contribution. I think it's pretty straightforward to calculate this. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So here's a photo of our wonderful um, National Visiting Committee with our staff, including uh, Dennis Faber here, who I believe is online with us. Now, 
we do compensate our National Visiting Committee members, so we wouldn't not count them as collaborators. But I know a lot of it, or some anyway, ATE centers um, don't pay their NBC members or advisory panel members. So I'm going to use an unpaid uh, advisory panel member as an example here. First, you would estimate the advisor's daily rate, um, what you would pay them if their time weren't donated. This doesn't have to be a precise figure, just in the ballpark. Um, you could use, for example, in our university, all faculty have access to the AAUP um, salary, the salary of everyone in the, in the, the faculty, um, what's the word, union. Um, so you could actually get a specific salary if it was internal. Um, but it doesn't have to be you know, a price size. Like I said, it's just in the ballpark, generally the value of their time. Then you would multiply that by the number of days contributed. Um, our NBC is contracted for eight days per year, so we know exactly how much time they're devoting to our project. And then that equals the value of the collaboration. For costs of donated services, um, like advertising, printing, conference calls, it's, I think it's easy to determine the value because it's whatever these things are being sold for in the market. Here's an example. Let's consider donated equipment. If a biotech firm donated 500 test tubes to your program, you would simply look at a lab supply catalog to find out what these would cost if you had to buy them. The collaboration questions appear in the first section of the survey, which we ask everybody to complete. Now the next section is on materials development. And we'll look at a question from that section. Um, this section is focused on materials. Strictly on, I'm quoting, strictly on materials developed for national dissemination to serve instructional purposes. And that is consistent with how materials development projects are defined in the ATE program solicitation. The first set of questions asked respondents to indicate the number of courses, modules, or activities. So right here. Um, they either drafted or completed in 2011. Then we asked for the number developed for each educational level, so high school, two year, four year or for a, a business or industry kind of training program. So a course is defined as a standalone collection of instructional content and activities to achieve desired educational outcomes. And we add on the, on the survey form that courses are usually, we're talking about a semester or a year long. A module is a self-contained collection of content and activities to set, to achieve a set, um, a specific objective or set of objectives. And modules are generally shorter than courses and focus on fewer outcomes. An activity is an instructional exercise, for example, a laboratory experiment designed to achieve a discrete learning outcome or test or measure achievement or progress toward an outcome. Now here are some examples. Now you don't have to decide where your material falls in those categories of course, module, activity. I don't want anyone to split hairs over this. We're just trying to get an overall sense of the productivity with regard to materials development, the kind of materials being developed, and who they're being developed for. Examples include our course curriculum, lab manuals, multimedia resources, problem-based scenarios, simulation applications. Now, things you wouldn't include would be things like newsletters, brochures, advertisements, posters, giveaways, things that are more promotional in nature rather than instructional. OK, we'll look at professional development next. In this section of the survey, the focus is on, and I'm quoting again, professional development provided to secondary school teachers, college faculty, and pre-service teachers to enhance their disciplinary capabilities, teaching skills, vitality, and understanding of current technologies and practices in areas that directly impact technician education. That's a long definition. So boiled down, it means the focus is on professional development for educators to improve their teaching. And the photo here is from Evaluate's workshop on evaluation at the last ATETI conference. But I want to point out here, we wouldn't actually answer in the professional development section. Because the work that we do, uh, the professional development work that we do, isn't really for educators for the purpose of improving their teaching. It may ultimately have that long long-term result, um, that isn't our immediate focus. Our immediate focus is on helping PIs and evaluators do their evaluations better. And I, so I want to remind folks here that if you feel a question is trying to make your round project fit into some square hole, then chances are you shouldn't be answering it. And it's okay 
to answer a question if it really does not apply to you. And that applies to all questions on the survey. I want to go a little bit um, further in professional development, though. This is a question from um, the professional development section. And there, admittedly, is a lot going on in this question. It's asking for the total number of participants from various educational levels. So is it faculty from secondary level, um, from associate level, um, four-year colleges, or, or somebody else? And then it's asking you know, how many participated in activities of various lengths, from short sort of awareness sessions to more long-term activities like uh, coaching and mentoring and so forth. Given the ATE program's really strong focus on two-year colleges, I believe NSF is pretty interested in finding out who the program is actually reaching. Is it benefiting those two-year colleges as intended? That's the question um, about educational levels that participants are coming from. The ATE program solicitation notes that professional development activities that, quote, typically include workshops, intensive sem seminars, industrial internships, or a combination of these. So those are the examples I provide here. Things that you would not count as professional development would be things like um, conference booths, um, materials to support professional development, views of online materials. The focus should be on a stru some structured activity to engage a certain group of people in a clearly defined professional development activity. OK, so next we're going to deal with the least clear-cut area, program development improvement which is where we deal with students and programs. This section of the survey is for grants that are focused on the development or improvement of technician education programs for secondary students, college students, or persons employed in technician positions in business and industry. OK, so what do we mean by a program? Well, a program is clearly defined as a sequence of classes, laboratories, and or work-based experiences that lead students to a degree, certification, or competence, occupational competency point. And I believe this is nearly verbatim uh, to what's in the program solicitation. So the first question um, in this area is about how many different places a program is offered, whether at different campuses of the same college or even different colleges. Um, for most grantees, a program is probably located at just one place. Um, the second question is getting at how many students the program reached. I know this is often the hardest question for people to answer, so I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. What students do you count? So anyone who, in, our, our, our general answer is anyone who enrolled in a course offered through a program that was the focus of an ATE funded uh, program improvement effort. Now, believe me, I know in reality this is not as black and white as it appears in print. Some programs are small, and it's easy to count the students because the faculty know them all personally. For other kinds of programs, that is definitely not the case. Dan Hull, who's going to speak in a little bit, supports a program at several partner colleges, and it's much tougher for him to get a handle on this. We've gotten all kinds of reports from PIs about the answers they provide to the question about student numbers, from wild guesses to very precise counts. Some people we talk to are convinced that all ATE PIs are just pulling numbers from the air, while we've talked to others um, that we know are taking great, great pains to get accurate counts. So we're going to have a little audience participation here. So um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand again if you're faculty or staff associated with a curricular program at a college. So how many people do we have here uh, who are in that role, like <coughs> you're involved in a delivery of an academic program in some way. So hands are going up. So enough. We can do this, I think. So Laura, would you make the marker tools available to particip participants again? This is always fun. So use your marker tool. Again, it's up to the left of the, um, I guess we call it a highlighter tool, the left of the, right by that little guy's head. To the, that, thank you. Um, select the marker tool in a color. And mark, draw a line somewhere on this continuum of where or uh, how confident you are in, in the numbers you report, the numbers of students. Um, where is it a wild guess, or are you down here where you are 100% confident in your precision? That is a beautiful picture. OK, 
And that's pretty much what I expect. I expected that there's people definitely all over this continuum. But in fact, see if I can get my marker. In fact, we are getting people more on this side. And that's and that's what we want. We're happy with that. I'm okay with that. I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect everyone to be at 100% uh, precision, and that's okay. We want people to be uh, further to the right, the better. The more precise, the better, but uh, good estimates are perfectly okay. Thank you for doing that. That was fun. All right, I'm going to use an example from our local two-year institution, Kalamazoo Community College. They have a wind energy technology certificate program. It's not ATE funded, but I think it probably has um, some things in common with many ATE funded programs. It's in, a, in an emerging area, for example, and it's interdisciplinary. And here are the course requirements for this certificate program. They have courses from a lot of different departments, computer information systems, drafting, electrical technology. Notice there's no uh, wind department, no WND courses, per se. So if this were a program started with ATE funds, and it was big enough that the PI didn't know how many students they had in the certificate program, it was difficult to get a handle on that somehow, um, they might count the students who took the core wind courses. And those would be, uh, where are they? ELT 122, wind turbine operations, maintenance and repair, and MSM 250, wind turbine mechanical systems. If you find, I'm hoping this example resonates with at least some of you, if you find yourself agonizing over getting precise counts, just remember the point here is to get that high level view of the ATE program, um, to, find, to get a good sense of, of the reach of the program, um, who it's reaching, and where, and, and with what, 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 what products. Um, I think that is the last of my slides, so I think we are ready for questions. Thanks so much, Lori. And we have one here from Dory. Are we talking just about the college level here because this person is working with secondary students? Um, the survey form does also get at um, secondary. I'm trying to find uh, Yeah, we asked for secondary, two-year, four-year, all those levels. Good. OK. And another question here. So what about, in our case, what about webinars? Do those count as materials? I would not count them as, well, it, you know, a, a webinar that Maytech does to educate, to provide professional development um, to technician educators, that could be considered a professional development activity. If the webinar archive is just sitting out there waiting for someone to happen across it, I wouldn't count that as a material. If it's an intrinsic um, component of a professional development activity, um, that's, a, you know, that's professional development. When we talk about curriculum materials, we're talking about delivering academic programs, and certificate programs, degree programs. So it's serving instructional purposes to educate um, you know, future technicians. OK, so conference sessions are a yes or a no? No. A no. OK. And um, websites, then, would also be a no? You know, websites, that's, your materials might go on your website, but if, if if the profess if you're counting a website as a professional development activity, no, I wouldn't think that would be appropriate because you don't know what anybody's, you know, getting out of it really. Uh, professional development really, you should know who the participants are. You should know what your you should have objectives. Um, it should be have you know tight parameters. It c it can be done online, but there has to be some sort of interaction and engagement with the individuals. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And then let's um, move on then to our next section, we'll hear from uh, Jason Burkhart, who will talk about getting information out of all this data. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as I was listening to the other sections here, I noticed uh, that there are some uh, names that are familiar to me, so good to see everyone. Uh, today, I am going to be spending some time talking about how data is turned into information uh, particularly in relation to the uh, annual survey. So we created this section of the webinar to give you a bird's eye view of how the data collection at the project or center level fits into the overall ATE program, and also how you can use all of those sources of data to benefit your project and your center as a whole. Uh, the purposes for which you collect data throughout the year often overlap. 
um, and understanding the overlapping nature of those data collection activities in ATE can help you to improve the efficiency in your project evaluation and program planning activities. So this first piece of the puzzle here that we've outlined is the annual survey. And since Lori spent a lot of time talking about the annual survey, I won't necessarily go into any kind of depth about that here. Now locking into the annual survey information, we have the annual fast lane report. So the annual fast lane report to uh, NSF describes your participants, collaborators, activities, results, and contributions. And that's information that you also usually need for the annual survey, and they, those often overlap. As a matter of fact, some of the survey, some of the annual survey is based on the information that you eventually need to report to NSF anyway. So then we add in the project level evaluation. Uh, the project level evaluation is a description of your project or center and its effectiveness. The information should be most directly relevant to you and it supports your operations as well as it will help you to identify areas for future growth. Um, and that information can also directly feed into future proposals for funding for your project or center. So also notice here how the information you collect for your project level evaluation overlaps with the information from the annual survey and from your uh, annual NSF fast lane report. As a matter of fact, NSF reporting requirements and the AT solicitation itself, uh, like I said before, form the basis for all of those sorts of constructions. Finally, we add in results from prior NSF support. So NSF AT solicitation requests that PIs who have previous grants from them uh, include a section in their grant proposals called re results from prior support. Uh, that section requires specific metrics on outcomes and results that demonstrate the impact, quality, and effectiveness of NSF uh, funded projects. So here you see that all of the other information that you've gained and synthesized from those other sections of the puzzle uh, eventually will feed into the basis uh, for the new grant proposals that you write. So while you may not be thinking about writing a proposal for your next grant at this point in your grant cycle, when that time comes, you'll thank yourself uh, because you'll already have a lot of good information that can be used to justify getting you uh, more funding in the, in the future. <clears throat> so now next we see this sort of typical year running from January to December uh, outlining some of the data collection activities that you'll have to do uh, throughout the year. Two of the milestones, the annual survey and the fast lane reporting, occur at about roughly the same time. So you see here annual fast lane, annual survey. This means that if you don't approach your data collection from an integrated perspective, you'll have a lot of separate data that you may have collected or may not have collected for, for that matter um, that you're going to have to collect in a very short period of time. So what that means is it's more likely that you'll have to cut some corners or scramble for some data, and that can prevent you from being able to include all the information you'd like to include in those reports. Because remember, these reports are the story of your project, and you want to be able to tell the most complete story that you uh, can. So also notice here that we put project level evaluation in the middle of these two. And that's not to say that's where project level evaluation should occur. But it, what it is saying is that a lot of times what happens is uh, if you don't collect the information on a regular basis, when it comes time for this annual fast lane report or even the annual survey, suddenly now you also have to do the project level evaluation in, in a very short amount of time so you have the information to report to uh, NSF. Now here we have that same timeline, but we've overlooked or overlapped an example of what it might look like if you were collecting data timed along with your uh, existing program or project activities. Uh, so you'll see um, it's best to sort of collect the data in real time. So for example, if you need to know how many of your students are doing some activity, it's easier to get that information uh, from role and attendance sheets that you distribute at that activity than to try and pull it from archival data or to get it uh, later. Also, it's a good time to take advantage of the captive audience data collection method, what I like to call it, in that if somebody is sitting in the seat at your activity and you also would like to know information about employment hours worked during the week, um, so not only when you collect the role do you get attendance information, you might also ask them the number of hours you've worked in the week. So you cut sort of dual pope purpose your uh, data collection instruments. So being proactive this way instead of reactive can save you a tremendous amount of time during those sort of collapsed uh, crunch periods. And it can also save you a lot of stress as well. 
Uh, you can see that there's some downtime over the summer here um, where there's typically not a lot of the reporting. That's a good time to start working on the results from prior NSF support uh, section of a grant proposal. And even if you're not writing a new grant proposal at the time, you can sort of keep that information collected in the form of a project beta, such as the one that ATE has, uh, Evaluate uh, 8 has. Um, so then that way, when you're ready to write the grant proposal, you'll already have that information ready to go. So managing your data. Uh, what, what, one of the things that really comes to mind is we had this experience when we were at the last AT, uh, ATPI conference at one of the breakfast roundtables uh, to talk to uh, Christy Johnson, who worked for a program uh, down in Tennessee that needed to analyze uh, data about attendance and professional development activities from uh, several program sites. So it's a multi-site uh, program or project. And that covered a large period of time uh, in the project from even before she was hired. So the information was contained in a lot of different formats at a lot of different places with a lot of different contact points. So her solution was to build a database that could keep track of all that information in sort of quote unquote real time, uh, such as attendance sheet information, such like that. So once she was able to establish that, then the sites were able to collect the data with a lot more efficiency. And then that, um, again, put them in a lot better position to collate reports and, and generate evaluations. So retrieval. So now you get information in, but now we've got to talk about getting information out. Uh, so this slide uh, reflects to you the idea of, uh, as the amount of retrieval time, uh, and you'll see here on the left, uh, high retrieval time uh, decreases uh, with the integrity of your initial data collection and storage. So the, the, the better you collect the data at the beginning, the less time it takes to retrieve. Simultaneously, the information that you gain increases. So you see here on the left where there's high retrieval time and low information, you get sort of an inefficient process. Whereas uh, you have low retrieval time, high information, it's very efficient, and that really is dependent on how you collect that initial data and how you store it. This slide kind of follows along with the other one. So there's this balance between fidelity or collecting a large amount of information about a narrow range of topics and bandwidth, which is collecting a small amount of information about a wide range of topics. Uh, sometimes you'll be asked to collect both types, or sometimes you'll have to find a balance between the two. Again, your ability to do this will depend on your data management strategy and your data collection plan. So assuming that an equal amount of time is spent collecting and managing your data, we see that there are three main breakpoints. You can either have the high fidelity, low bandwidth, you can have the low fidelity, high bandwidth, or the equilibrium point. So an example of high fidelity, low bandwidth information would be a survey that had a lot of questions related to, let's say, employment status. This type of instrument could provide highly detailed information, but may not give you but one variable's worth of data. And that doesn't provide much other information about the student. The reverse, an example of low fidelity, high bandwidth information would be a general psychosocial assessment that maybe asks one or two questions per section about a wide range of topics, such as employment, academic outcomes, socioeconomic statuses, uh, measure of life skills, et cetera. That gives you a lot of information about the student, but that, measure, that type of measurement is less precise. So we're going to take a look at an example from Evaluate. Uh, about how we handle this sort of thing. So we collect some basic information from our registration list and from our attendance sheets, such as those from our workshops or webinars. Uh, we collect information such as role within the AT project, email addresses, et cetera. So we can monitor and evaluate our, re our reach and impact within the AT project. And also so we can send out materials like webinar invitations and those sorts of things. Originally, we used to keep our data in an Excel flat file or a spreadsheet where each piece of data has its own column and each person has their own row. This is fine if your goal is sort of general record keeping and if each project only has one person associated with it. However, our spreadsheet was 42 columns wide and there are about 900 people on the list, which means we ended up with about 37,800 individual bits of data. Well, that's a lot to manage and it definitely isn't easy to manage in the Excel uh, file. 
And there's also a lot of repetition of information, um, and the information was difficult to extract for analysis, and it was hard to link information about the projects, the columns, uh, with the people associated with them, or the rows. So what we did is we restructured this database into a Microsoft Access database. And this is a representation. And what that does is it sort of breaks the large spreadsheet and the uh, down into separate tables. And that allows us to reduce duplication. And then it, uh, we can churn out a nice uh, chart here. And this chart gives us a lot of information that allows us to make a lot of decisions. Now, I know some of you may not have access to Microsoft Access. Uh, the important lesson in this is that you come up with a strategy, that you stick to it, and that strategy is feasible, and that it gives you the uh, information that you want. OK? Uh, so then you analyze and synthesize the data. So this is just a little visual representation of a lot of the information that we can get out of a small amount of restructuring of the data. Here, uh, this is some of the things that we've learned from our research. For example, our original intent was to focus on PIs and evaluators in the ATE project. However, as our center has grown and evolved, we learned that other groups of people that are connected to ATE have been attending our webinars and workshops particularly project staff besides PIs and evaluators, and also administrators at colleges that house AT projects and centers. We now know that we could do more to reach out to those individuals because they're, they're interested in what we do. Also, by analyzing our data this way, we've learned that we can't always capture the role information about AT individuals depending on how those participants came to us. Those are the no those individuals noted as unknown. So for us, when we report and analyze the data, we have to account for the fact that some of the people on our list are in the unknown category, or else we could underestimate our reach and impact. This chart, learning about this chart also told us that we need to do more in tracking and finding out role information from people at the time at which they sign up for our services. Here, we also discover that we're not making, in, or that we're not making sufficient inroads in reaching PIs. Although evaluators make up just 30% of our total participants, their participants in each of our services is more than 40%. So evaluators are relatively more likely to participate than PIs in these events. And that's kind of important to know because it allows us to target our outreach more effectively. Again, when we look at the, uh, the data more closely, this reflects that sort of the same trend you'll see here. And uh, again, role attendance at either a webinar or a workshop. We learn about the gaps in our services and ways in which we can target our uh, you know, further outreach efforts. Benchmarking. So the, at the highest level, when you complete the AT survey and we get the data, we create these sort of data snapshots. Um, so with these data snapshots, what that allows you to do is get an ATE-wide aggregate view of some of the information about all of the projects and centers. And you can use that to compare yourself or your own project uh, to that information. So we'll take a quick uh, look at how to do that. We have percentage of female students in ATE-funded programs. Uh, and this is one of the data snapshots that we provide. Then you'll see, for example, in the information and communications technologies uh, industry, we have 31% uh, of students in that uh, sector are female. So if you at Acme Communi uh, Community College IT program have 40% of your students are female, then you can see that you're sort of above the average for the AT project. So that tells you that your efforts in reaching that population are very successful. And here, this is just sort of the zoom in so you can get a better look at it. Finally, the other aspect of benchmarking or comparison uh, lets us find out how our program is growing over time. So you can see here, this is again Acme Community College. The ATE benchmark is 31%. And you see from the period of 2005 to 2007, the uh, percentage of students that were female was well below the ATE benchmark. Over the course of the grant, that number increased. And in 2010, the program uh, roughly met the benchmark. At 2011, however, when ACME was up for grant renewal, we see that they were well above the benchmark. This is great information about ACME's uh, program's impact on reaching females uh, in the IT industry. So you can see when you go to fill out the results of the prior support section, 
now you have a lot of powerful information um, to offer. So at this point, I know that's a lot of information, and it's very uh, shallow uh, in depth or shallow look at how to collect and, and deal with data. Um, so definitely, it behooves you to follow up on that. And uh, I guess now we'll take some questions. Hey there, Jason. I think we're actually going to turn things over to Dan, and then we'll catch up on questions after Dan's section is done. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Hall. I'm the PI and the uh, uh, Executive Director of Optech with the National Center for Optics and Photonics Education. <clears throat> we're located in Waco, Texas, but we're based out of the University of Central Florida. That may sound a little strange, but it's really a good situation for us. The University of Central Florida has a major laser research and development center and the collaboration between us works very well. We're working with seven partner colleges in our center and, and the states that I have listed there. Uh, we also are working with 31 colleges through a network that we form. So we've got a lot of colleges that we're working with around the country, but these seven uh, actually get some of our subgrants from us and they do a good bit of our work. Uh, we're in the sixth year of our operation. We began in 2006. Uh, Photonics is a fancy name for lasers and optics. But it's, a, it's an enabling technology for many fields, in, in the field of medicine, the field of defense, the field of manufacturing, telecommunications, a lot of areas. It's, we're just kind of broadly scattered around, among all these. And the technicians that, that work in these areas, um, some work in the laser and optics R&D area. Some provide, um, uh, they work in the, where they're manufacturing laser and optics equipment. But many of them are working in fields where they're using this equipment and techniques. So that's, that's pretty broad. Our goal is to provide an, an adequate, su adequate supply of well-educated technicians for both the R&D, for the service, and field services in that area, and applications in these enabled fields. Um, we encourage and assist colleges to start new AAS programs and photonics programs. We've done We'll talk about our needs assessment later. There are technicians that are working with high school uh, diplomas. There are some that are working with certificates, and, and some that are working with very little, and some that are working with baccalaureate. But most, most of our employers want them to have AAS photonics uh, degrees. And so that's what we really work toward. And we have to help colleges grow toward that. Sometimes it takes three to five years for colleges to start offering courses and to move forward. But we encourage and assist them in starting. We, we help them do needs assessments. We, we help them do lab designs and so forth. We're also trying to build up the capacity of the existing programs. So we support the growth and improvement of programs in these 31 colleges. Um, I can tell you that when we started, I thought program evaluation was a nuisance. I, I didn't have a lot of time for it. I didn't feel like I could spend all that budget money on it and so forth. Today, it's a very vital piece of our center, and I'll show you how. The program evaluation is key to the focus and efficient accomplishment of our goals. When we write a pro our proposal, and we're, we're in our second uh, second phase now, uh, in the second year of a three-year grant, uh, we, we lay out what we're going to do in every year, but every year we go back and revise that, and a lot of it is based on the evaluation that we have. Uh, our evaluation team is, is pretty broad. We have an external evaluator. He's a VP at a community college. He's not one of our colleges, but he's, he's very good. And uh, he designs an, our annual evaluation plan, and he reports to our National Visiting Committee. We have an internal evaluator who does conducts the studies that are necessary to carry out this evaluation, to quantify the needs and the capacity, and to assure the center progress is being done. We have a National Visiting Committee that review the evaluations that we meet, and, and usually in May and June, with our, our meet. And they, we review the, uh, review the evaluations with the PIs and the staff. Um, then based on the recommendations of the Evaluation Committee and, and from our evaluators, I go back and in, that, in the summer I formulate the goals and strategies for the next year. Um, our evaluators then go back and they determine the metrics that will be used. Our, our year starts in September, so they, they determine the metrics that will be used to assess the next year's progress. That's our evaluation team, 
and it works very well. Um, well I want to give you an example of the two examples that we have. One of them is is our capacity. We need an, we we've done these assessments, and and we did one in. Uh, 2009. We're going to repeat it uh, starting in about two weeks. It's an expensive ta task. We'll spend twenty-eight thousand dollars this year plus our evaluators' time to write this up. But to do this study, we can't do it with with uh, telephone or with, with uh, uh, mail or email surveys. We have to use telephones. We use a survey research center at the University of North Texas to help us do it. But we determined the in 2009, we determined the annual projected annual needs for new technicians, and it comes out over a five-year period about 1,200 new technicians per year. Then we looked at the the capacity. How many? Uh, we want to project the enrollment and completers of the 31 colleges when we talk to them, and we're getting about 270 uh, completers a year. So, you know, our gap is there. We need 1,200, and we have 270. Uh, that are coming out. So that's what I wake up with every morning. That's what I say. That's Optech's mission, to close that gap and to improve quality in what we're doing. Um, we, we, we do that two ways uh, to do this. Uh, one is to increase the number of photonics programs and then to improve the average enrollment and the retention in the programs that we have. So we're working with those seven colleges and and with a lot of, right now about 21 uh, colleges are interested in starting programs. We're working with them, going through their planning process. Uh, we, we provide faculty training for, for new program planning. Uh, and in addition to that, we're trying to build in all of our colleges a more robust high school pipeline. And uh, we, we're doing things to try to improve retention. We've, we've put in, developed a lot, we've identified 11 math concepts. The students don't have these math concepts, and they're not calculus, but if they don't know these math concepts, they're not going to make it through the first two courses. So we develop video math tutorials, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're using those. That's that's kind of our capacity. That's what we've had to do while we've had, to, while we've had these studies. Why we go back and look at that, and it tells us uh, what, what we need to do for the next year. Um, let me give you a second example, and that's on program improvement. It's, one of my goals is a task that is, is PI that I enjoy doing, and I, I spend uh, a, a, at least an hour and a half maybe every day looking at a, numerous uh, briefings and things to look at emerging technologies in the field of lasers, optics, and so forth. And one of them that came up in the last two years is fiber lasers. We can do things in manufacturing and and other areas with fiber lasers at about a fourth to a fifth the cost of what we could do with, with other lasers like carbon dioxide lasers and, and that YAG lasers and so forth. The fiber, and they're much more reliable. So fiber lasers in the last several years have emerged, and they're emerging very quickly. When, when we identified this two years ago, we didn't have any materials in fiber lasers. So uh, we needed to develop that. Uh, another the thing we wanted to do is to examine the effective strategies to improve teaching and learning. And what we've done, we've done this over the last three years. We've developed e-books. Our initial effort to develop e-books was to reduce the cost of books to the, to the students. But what we learned is once we had e-books, we could put enhancements in. I mentioned those, those uh, uh, math concepts. We, there are 11 math concepts that have to have. We developed these video tutorials. Now in the e-book, when the student's reading along in the e-book and they get to a problem and they can't work a problem unless they understand, say, ratio and proportions, there's a little icon that comes up and says, you need a little help on it. They click it, and this just-in-time in, uh, tutorial comes up and talks to them a little bit about uh, uh, this math concept and then works several problems for them. So we think that's really helping to... Uh, uh, and we, we're getting good data from our evaluation to find out that, that it's helping uh, in our retention. Um, once, these, once we've identified things like we need new fiber lasers or we need these, these enhancements and so forth, we develop curriculum materials uh, and we develop these enhancements. Then we evaluate them. And our evaluators get in place and they, they design these evaluations. Uh, we have, first, we have the employers review the materials. Are they accurate, they're current, they're up to date? Then we pilot test these materials, primarily with their pilot, uh, with their seven 
partner colleges and their classes, and based on that, we revise the materials and bring them up. That's just kind of not rocket science, but but that's kind of what we do, and that's that's how we that's how we, how we continue to ensure program improvement. We're this year we're looking at uh, our evaluators are speaking to employers who have hired these technicians and saying, "Are you satisfied with the technicians that you're hiring?" And if not, what's the problem? Are, we, are, we, are there some topics we're not covering? Are we not teaching them enough in depth? Do they need more problem-solving abilities and things like that? We are developing new problem-solving scenarios to make sure that that goes into place. So that, um, that's kind of how we use our program evaluation, and it's become an extremely critical part of the way we identify and, and re focus our, our goals for each year. Let me talk a minute about the Evaluate Survey and how it benefits us. Um, it's, a, we're, it's a difficult one, as, as Lori mentioned. Uh, we have, um, we don't teach anything here at, at, at our center here in, or at the University of Central Florida. We have, they're being taught out there in seven partner colleges and 31 colleges. So we have to collect that data and retrieve that data from what we support. I'll be honest with you, I, I was over in the, the, the left third of that chart that you saw a while ago about whether we were getting precise data or whether we were doing what I call swags. And we, 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 couldn't, we, couldn't, we didn't have that data very efficiently. We now have coordinators at each of our 31 colleges, and we support them. If they'll, if they'll do what we want them as coordinators, we pay for them to come to the high-tech conference. We pay their... We pay their uh, travel and we pay their uh, their admission into the conference, and, uh, and but we expect them to collect this data for us, and they do that, and we're building a good network with them. The data from these colleges tells us their strengths and needs. If we're trying to build and strengthen these colleges, we need to know whether they need more webinars on things like fiber optics, uh, fiber lasers, and things like that. Whether they need uh, other information, so. We we provide things like that. We we found out that that they uh, I was posting blogs for a long time. They really preferred uh, emails from us, and so now about every two weeks I send them some new information in the emails, and we can now get the data from them, and we can compare our progress in the certain areas and the norms of the survey data. Well, I think I've probably talked enough. Uh, if you have any questions or comments. Uh, let me know what they are, and I'll be glad to talk about them. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. And I think what we'll do right now is um, buzz through this section and start our closing material, and then we'll handle some questions as we can when we wrap up. So um, we're going to ask you to try to multitask a little bit here. You probably figured out that we are really into surveying at Evaluate, so we want to take a minute now to survey you about this webinar. So um, in just a moment, a survey is going to appear up on your screen. Can you take just a minute and give us your feedback about this content today and what else you'd like to see us talk about in our future webinars? So I think that Lara is going to bring up the survey for you in just a second. It'll take you less than a minute to complete. Just um, give us a little bit of feedback. And while the survey is going, let's return to some of the questions that we weren't able to address. Um, so Lori, I think that this question will go to you. Stephen brought it up a while ago. Um, they developed a course with ATU funds, and it's used in a degree program. Is that program improvement? Uh, yeah, I would say yes. I'm not. I think maybe this question is more complicated than I'm realizing. So if he wants to add something to it, it's definitely what we in the category of program improvement. I mean, we're asking about numbers of um, programs. We're asking about numbers of uh, courses, modules, and activities. So a course would definitely fall under that domain of program improvement. Yeah, that completely makes sense. OK. Um, and then will you go ahead and talk a little bit about the question that Dennis had brought up about getting um, the specific data on benchmarking? Sure. Dennis asked uh, specific questions about, um, let's go up a little bit. Can he ask for the bench for benchmark purposes? Can survey data snapshots be broken down further by college demographics? For example, large versus small, urban versus suburban, versus rural, and others. And the answer to that is that oh heavens, that sounded terrible. I got a terrible sound in my head, but nobody else got it. The answer to that is 
If it's the variables on the survey, we can break it down by that variable. Now, the specific of large versus urban, uh, large versus small, urban versus suburban, those specifics aren't on the survey. We do have, I mean, if, for example, you could break it down by disciplinary area. You could break it down by two-year college versus four-year. You could break it down by number of students served, for example, size of grant. If it's on the survey, we can slice it pretty much any way you want it. And I would like to, you know, reiterate we're happy to take um, requests. We sent, we've sent we um, sent notices out to all PIs inviting, you know, requests for specific kinds of slices of the data, specific looks at it, whether it's in a snapshot form or something else. And we're happy to accommodate those requests. We just um, need to know what your needs are. Great. And so we're going to close the survey after this next question, this short question that I'm going to pitch to Lori. Lori, uh, what about completing the survey on a mobile device like an iPad? Um, I would not recommend it. I, I doubt it would work. It wasn't designed with that in mind, and I seriously doubt it would work. Um, given the amount of work it takes just to get it on a normal platform, chances are that it's not uh, something that's in our future unless there's a really a big demand for it. But this year's survey, definitely not. Okay, that's really good to know. All right, we're going to close the survey now in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thanks for your time there. And speaking of time, we're going to be back in two months with a webinar on figuring out what to measure in an ATE grant. And that webinar will feature Lana Rux, an ATE external evaluator. So join us there. And here is another opportunity for professional development for evaluators. The American Evaluation Association hosts a short webinar series. These webinars are only 20 minutes long, and they're free for AEA members. January 19th, tomorrow, they're talking about one of my favorite topics, information visualization. And on January 26th, they'll discuss how to handle the evaluation when the program changes. And we think both of these would be relevant to you. So we encourage you to join AEA and attend these webinars. If you're looking more for more specific information on ATE evaluation, our website is a good place to go. You can find the recordings of our past webinars. Uh, you can join our listserv. You can locate an evaluator in our directory. You can download issues of our newsletter. The listserv in particular would be a good place to ask questions if some arise for you after we're done here today. So I recommend that you head to our website and, and sign up there. Looks like we may have time to sneak in um, one more question here. So um, Lori, I'm going to pitch it to you. How would uh, someone get their answers to the survey after the survey period is over? And that is a question that we've gotten so frequently. We put it in our frequently asked questions, which is also available from the survey section of our website. Um, you can just print it out when you're in your browser, like literally print it on your printer. You can print it to a PDF before you close the survey. Usually what happens is somebody does their final submit and realizes they didn't do that. Um, and that's fine. You just send us an email saying, I, I want a copy of my responses, and we'll be happy to create a PDF for you. Um, and I'd invite anybody at this point, if they want to, if they don't have their responses from last year and they want to know what was put down, particularly when there's a change in PIs, folks are interested in that. Um, so we're happy to accommodate that. Just send me an email and give me your grant number, um, probably the PI's name as well, and we'll generate that PDF and send it to you. Perfect. All right, well, on behalf of Lori Wingate, Jason Burkhart, David Campbell, and Dan Hall, thank you so much for being with us. Have a great day.